You can teach, but are you teachable? Ain't got no help in here tonight. It, you a deacon, but are you disciplined? Your name is on the roll, but are you enrolled in Bible study? I'm talking about training day, because if all you want is, a, is an assignment, God can't use you unless you can be a kid. What kills me about some folks is that they get a revelation on Saturday and want to be released on Sunday. this occasion for which we are gathered. It serves to remind us of what it really means to be part of the body of Christ. I believe as we grow and as we mature in our daily walk with God, I'm sincerely convicted of the fact that every now and then we ought to examine our motives for ministry in other words are we certain about our salvation do we really know the meaning of our membership what is the purpose for our positions and are we really clear about our calling one of the questions that I hear consistently amongst Christians is the, is the issue, rather, of what have I been called to do? In other words, everybody wants to know what they're on this earth for. What would God have me to do? What is his will for my life? Am I called to preach? Am I called to be in leadership? What is my purpose for living? What is my reason for getting out of the bed every day? And brothers and sisters, I've learned not to try to answer that question for them with specificity. But what I do know tonight is all of us were saved to serve. I wish I had a little more help here. I said all of us from the choir stand to the pulpit to the pew to the parking lot, all of us on some level were saved to serve. Yeah, in some area or another, in some place or another, while it is God that ultimately makes the decision, we need to be clear that none of us were saved just to sit down. Tell somebody around you, he preaching to you tonight. I say, none of us were saved just to sit down. If the Lord saves you, you ought to serve him. If he's been good to you, you ought to live like you're grateful. Talk to me here. If you truly know that Jesus is your Lord, is your Savior, is the head of your house, is the head of your life, the question of the night is when did you meet him and what have you done for him lately? I reckon I'll go ahead and preach here. I said, the question of the night is, when did you meet Jesus? And what have you done for him lately? Don't tell me you was a member of the church 30 years. I want to know, what have you done for him lately? Don't tell me your title. Don't tell me your position. Don't tell me how long you've had keys to the church. I want to know, what have you done for Jesus lately? So, it's not the question of, am I anointed? Am I gifted? Am I talented? The anointing was given to you when you accepted Christ. Wish I had a witness in here. You were anointed the moment you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart. Why? Because if Christ means the anointed one, then anybody who is a Christian is already anointed. And so then, if the anointing was already been given to me, listen to this, before you try to go out and serve, it would behoove you to make sure you save. 
I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that again. I said, before you go looking for something to do, before you seek to serve, you better be real sure about whether or not you really say. Can I teach before I preach here? I'm telling you that there must be an encounter. Watch me now. Between the Savior and the Saul. I said again. I said there must be an encounter between the Savior and the Saul. When there's an encounter between the Savior and the Saul, that brings about the change from sinner to saint. The text says that Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord he went unto the high priest and he desired of him letters to Damascus to send to the churches that if he found anybody that was a follower of Christ if he found anybody that was in the way because back then Christians were not called Christians they were called people of the way he said, if I find anybody that's following the way, whether they're men or women, I'm going to tie them up and bring them to Jerusalem to be slaughtered. In other words, Saul was a murderer, a killer of Christians. He was on his way to Damascus, and it was not until he was confronted by the Christ, only then could he see the error of his ways. If you hold me, I promise I'll preach here. Verse 3 says that Saul came near Damascus. And suddenly, we all got to have a suddenly moment. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, God knows your name. <laughs> Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said in verse 5, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, uh, whom thou persecutest, and it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Come here. I don't know if you know it or not, but all of us have had a Saul season in our life. Talk to me here. It's that season where couldn't nobody tell you nothing. It's that season when you were doing your own thing. It's that season when you were full of hell. Keep sitting there. Hell. It's that season when you could do crime with no conscience. It was that season when lying was your lifestyle. It was that season when wickedness was your way of life. Is there anybody other than me who can remember your Saul season? Some of y'all still there. That's why you ain't saying amen right now. But to the rest of us who can be honest tonight, tell your neighbor, I've been there. Need some folk to be honest tonight. You ain't always been preaching. Keep sitting there here. You ain't always been singing in the choir. You ain't always been a deacon. You ain't always been a mother. You ain't always been serving on the door. You ain't always been a missionary. You ain't always been anxious to get to church, don't you know? There was a time when Thursday was just a tune-up for Friday. All right, just got paid. It's Friday night. I wish I had some, <laughs> some real folk here. But then one day, uh, on your way to doing wrong, uh, you were confronted by Jesus Christ uh, and the reality of your sin. How many of y'all can be honest? I was on my way to the turn up spot. I, I was on my way to doing wrong. I was on my way to doing what I wanted to do. And then I was confronted by the Christ. He said, it ain't your mama and them you kicking against. It ain't church folk you're letting down. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. And all this stuff you're doing, you just kicking against the bricks. God has a way of confronting you in your Saul season. Part of Brother Hadley's examination was making sure that he saved. And if indeed you are saved, you cannot leave out the fact that you was a sinner. The text said that Saul was trembling and was astonished and said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, what, what, 
What is it that you have for me? What, what is my assignment? Why have you knocked me down? What, what is it that you want me to do? And the Lord said, I want you to arise. Go into the city. And it shall be told to you what you must do. It said that the men that journeyed with him stood speechless. That's verse number seven. I told you I'm preaching the whole 20 verses here. And they heard a voice, but they didn't see nobody. They saw Saul. They heard the voice. But the encounter was between Saul and the Savior. Just as a quick side note, when the Lord is doing something in your life, it ain't for everybody to understand. Somebody ought to talk to me here. They heard something, but they didn't see nothing. And sometimes you can't worry about whether or not other folk understand it, whether or not they like it, what they got to say about your situation. Because the fact of the matter is, everybody in here is on their own journey, and we all got our own assignment, our own charge to keep, and our own God to glorify. Tell your neighbor, I'm in my own season. I'm in my own season. And so Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. I'm in verse number eight. It says that they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Verse nine said that he was three days without sight. Three days he was blind, and he was there and did not eat nor drink. A few points, and I'll bid y'all a good evening. Once Paul was saved, once he was converted, what we learn about this process of salvation, we call it the process of becoming around here, is not all about the destination. The joy is in the journey. Y'all understand what I'm saying here? It's not about getting there. It's not about the destination. It's about the learning and the journey and the training along the way. I need you to understand tonight that salvation is not the end. Salvation is the beginning of the process and it's something that God does in you for the rest of your life. Hear me now, because you're going to need that in a minute. I said it's a journey, not a destination, because constantly, each and every day, God is working on us. Can I get an honest church in here? I say God is working on us. He's working on our attitudes. He's working on our tempers. He's working on our patience. He's working on our mentality. He's working on our ideas and our ideals. He's working through our filter of how we understand things. And the problem that I have with a whole lot of Christians is that far too many of us want the destination, but we don't want to follow directions. It's going to get good from here. I said, we want the destination, but we don't want to follow directions. That's why before Saul got ahead of himself, the Lord arranged ahead of time a stay at Ananias' house. You have to keep reading through chapter 9. The Lord came to Ananias in a vision, called him by name. He said, Ananias. And Ananias said, Behold, Lord, here am I. He said to Ananias, I want you to arise and go into the street called Straight. You know, that ain't nothing but Jesus there. He said, I want you to get up and head toward Straight Street. And ask around in the house of Judas for a man named Saul of Tarsus. Why? Because he is praying there and he's waiting. I've already sent him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias said, uh, Lord, we know this dude. Wish I had some help here. We his reputation precedes him. We know this guy. Uh, I understand what you're saying, Lord, but Tara, he a thug. Can't help it. I'm in the Bible. You just don't know where I am. He, he, he said, Lord, we know him. We know his reputation. He done killed some of the brothers and the sisters already, and you want me to bring him to my house? 
God said, go that way. Why? Because he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Watch this. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Let me hurry up and tell you something. I don't care what folk know about you. Keep, 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 keep sitting there. Yeah. I, I don't care what folks say. I don't care what folk think. I don't care what your past may have been. When God has called your name, when God has something for you to do, he is not calling you because you're qualified. He's calling you because he called you. What made Paul a powerful preacher was that he never forgot his testimony. He was quick to tell folk, I persecuted the church. I am the least to be called an apostle. And even with all his religious background, he never forgot that it was the Savior who gave him significance. Can I say this without you getting mad? Not that I care, but I'm, I'm trying to act as if, you know, because we got guests in the room. Listen, do you think God cares about your degree? To talk to me here. You think God is impressed with your money, with your position, with your reputation in the city, with all your connections downtown? God will take an humble man who ain't got no credentials, ain't got no credibility, ain't got no hookups. He'll take a sister that don't know nobody at the bank, will take a sister that is new in town, will take somebody that don't nobody know, and he will use you because you will tell the truth about how you got here. God said, I got something for him to do. But before you run out and preach to the world, even though you're anointed, you still need instruction. Tell somebody you're anointed, but you need instruction. That's what I mean when I say training day. Because even though Saul was called by God, watch me now, his anointing did not exempt him from accountability. When I met Eddie and Diane and little Eddie Hadley, they just about interviewed me to see if this church was worthy of their membership. About seven years ago, they set up a time, came in, walked in, young family, and asked me questions to see if this was a place where they wanted to worship. Why, why they do that? Because, in other words, I was a deacon at my former church. I was a servant leader in that congregation. So now that me and my family have relocated, we're looking for a place to continue what God started. As a pastor, I can appreciate that because we're always looking for people to get off the pew. But what I have to be able to discern about any disciple is whether or not you are willing to submit to training day. You can teach, but are you teachable? Ain't got no help in here tonight. You a deacon, but are you disciplined? Your name is on the roll, but are you enrolled in Bible study? I'm talking about training day because if all you want is, a, is an assignment, God can't use you unless you can be accountable. What kills me about some folk is that they get a revelation on Saturday and want to be released on Sunday. It's finna get quiet in here now. The Lord called me. The Lord got this. I had a dream. It, it was a burning fire. And the Lord just got it in my spirit. I can just feel it. The Lord said that I'm supposed to do this. And the Lord said I'm supposed to do that. And then the pastor don't let you have your way. Now all of a sudden, pastor scared of me. Oh, he don't want me to preach because he know if I preach, I turn this place out. He know I steal every member he got. Them folk will follow me in a minute. Please understand, ain't nobody scared of you. 
Because listen, there is a time and a season for everything. And the reason why Saul couldn't just be released to preach in Jerusalem is because he had to be examined to make sure he was authentic. You don't hear from the Lord on Saturday and get thrown into something on Sunday. Listen, only in the church are we allowed to operate with no training. You can't show up to the airport and fly no airplane. Talking about the Lord called me. You don't get to show up to TMH with a scalpel and some scrubs. Talking about I had a vision from the Lord to do open heart surgery. Only in the church do people just get to walk in, no training, no kind of discipline, no kind of accountability, and then get mad when folk won't release us. The most important part of this whole sermon is in verses 17 through 19. It says, and Ananias went his way, entered into the house, put his hands on Saul, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord appeared to me when you were coming this way. He sent me that thou mightest receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes scales and he received his sight and he arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. All of this happened at Ananias' house. And Saul was there certain days with the other disciples that were in Damascus. I'm telling you, we are in a dangerous place when it comes to this new church stuff. Because we got folk in position and serving, and we don't even know if they saved. You ought not be able to pray on God's program if you ain't saved. You ought not be able to count God's money unless you saved. You ought not be able to greet nobody at God's door unless you're saved. You ought not be able to read no scripture, sing no song, play no instrument, or preach his word unless it is clear to the other disciples at Damascus that you are saved. We just let any and everything go on in the church. And the reason why we keep catching it is because we give folk titles who ain't been touched. <laughs> yeah, this way he get it from. I said, you give folk titles. And we ain't even sure if they've been touched. Even if you are saved, that don't mean you jump into leadership right away. Saul, and this is what we don't know. This is what we don't realize. Saul stayed at Ananias' house and amongst the disciples three years before anybody ever heard his mouth. Sat there three years. <laughs> got, 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 got all the members coming to him on the side. When pastor gonna let you preach? I like it when you preach. When, when, when pastor going to give you a chance? If you ever get called to a church now, I, I, I'll go with you. Three years. Never had a sermon. Never taught a Bible study, never sang a song, never did anything in leadership. And I'm telling you, we're dealing with folk who have no patience. Saul stayed with Ananias three years. Some of us don't want to wait three months. But all oh, brothers and sisters, when training day in Jerusalem was finally over, that's when he was released to go out and preach the word. There are two kinds of preachers, my granddaddy said, in the world today. Brethren, he said, you do, he said, you have those who were sent. And then you have those who just went. I wish I had help to close here. 
And you might be wondering tonight, Pastor, what is the difference? Well, uh, the difference is when you just went, all you have is what you got on your own. In other words, when you went, you go around flashing your degree because that's all you got to stand on. When you just went, you go around telling people how much money you make a year because that's all you really have going for you in the world. But uh, the difference between well, uh, somebody that went uh, and the one who was sent uh, is that when you know uh, that it was God who sent you, uh, yeah, he has a way uh, of giving you what you need uh, as you journey uh, along the way. Uh, well, uh, in other words, uh, you may not have uh, everything uh, that you feel like you need. Uh, when you first go out to serve the Lord uh, but every step that you take uh, and uh, every move uh, yeah that you make uh, the Lord uh, has a way of providing for you uh, everything uh, that you need uh, have I got a witness here uh, well uh, I'm glad uh, that when the Lord uh, said Saul, uh, she gave him uh, everything that he needed uh, in order to carry out uh, the work of the Lord. Uh, in other words, uh, she didn't have to troll around. Uh, I need a sermon.com uh, to figure out what to preach on Sunday. Uh, have I got a witness here? Uh, he didn't have to watch the Word Network uh, trying to be like a TV preacher. Uh, Y'all don't hear me. The trainings that he got at Ananias' house, it gave him the words to go out and be a witness. He told them about a man named Jesus, the one that was born in Bethlehem. Have I got a witness here? He told them about that Jesus. That turned water in the wine. Y'all don't hear me. He told them about that same Jesus who healed the woman with the issue of blood. He the same one that went out in the desert with 5,000 men, turned a little boy's lunch in the new time buffet. Can I get a witness? Is him. He the same one that marched to Lazarus' grave, called him from the dead after a four-day stink. Y'all know who I'm talking about. He the same one that woke you up this morning, started you on your way. Is there anybody here? got your own testimony uh, because when you go out uh, to witness for Jesus, uh, the best testimony uh, is not what he did for Lazarus, uh, not what he did for Mary, uh, not what he did for Martha, uh, but what the Lord uh, has done for you. Uh, he told them uh, how he was lost, uh, but now he's found. Uh, told them how he was blind but now he can see but in all your telling don't you forget to tell the best part tell them early. one Friday morning that same Jesus went on the cross they stretched him wide and they hung him high tell him he died don't you know he died? Uh, he died uh, for your sin and mine. Uh, but you can't leave him there, Reverend. Uh, take him off that cross. Uh, put him in a borrowed tomb. Uh, tell them 
them uh, we stayed uh, all day Friday uh, all Friday night uh, stayed there uh, all day Saturday uh, and all Saturday night uh, but don't leave him there Reverend uh, cause you gotta get him up uh, but I heard Jesus say uh, if you wanna go up uh, you gotta come down uh, he went down down uh, down down uh, in the sea of hell uh, preached a revival uh, from Friday to Saturday uh, and then tell somebody uh, tell them hell 